Chapter 7 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape. Chapter 7 The White God. Bram Forrest returned to consciousness and realized the black nausea of his previous moments had vanished. All traces of the sickness were gone as he opened his eyes his mind intent upon the small flat package that had dropped from the box in which he had found the strange, disc-like instrument. But the package was not within reach. This caused only a small part of his bewilderment, however. His attention was riveted mainly upon the tableau being enacted before him. A group of people, almost as naked as himself, deeply browned of skin, stood huddled nearby. Almost as though for the entertainment of these, Two grim and uniformed warriors were facing each other on the level turf before the strange, circular ground entrance beside which Bram Forrest found himself. The two warriors possessed strange, supple swords, which they manipulated with much skill. At least one of the warriors did. The other seemed clumsy in comparison, but there was no hint of cowardice in his manner. Upon closer inspection, the two warriors who had seemed of a cut at first glance were quite dissimilar. The one of greater skill was dark and possessed of a cruel mouth and venomous dark eyes. The other was slim and fair, with contemptuous blue eyes. He fought with an erect stiffness in his shoulders which was both awkward and dignified at the same time. The sympathy of Bram Forrest went out instinctively to the fair one, but the dark, sinister swordsman held his attention. There was something naggingly familiar about the dark one's cruel face. A tantalizing familiarity had bemused Bram Forrest, even as the singing swords thrust and parried, with that of the dark warrior always on the offensive, and the other fighter striving more for self-preservation than for aggressiveness. Where, Bram Forrest wondered, had he seen the Dark One before? Nowhere, of course. Any previous contact was impossible. Or was it? Dared he, Bram Forrest, call anything impossible after what had already occurred? Bram Forrest glanced down and realized he had been removing the disc from his left wrist and placing it on his right. He had committed the act instinctively, in the same manner he breathed and moved, and his mind went back momentarily to the two tubes he had found in his ears when he awoke in the cavern back on earth. Back on earth? How did he know he was not still on that planet? I've got to stop questioning these things I possess knowledge of, but know not why. I must take them at face value and without wonder. Otherwise I shall spend all my years in conflict with my own mind. At that moment... The dark warrior's whipsword whined in a skillful arc and entered the body of the fair one. A moan of sympathy arose from the waiting group as the defeated warrior sank to the ground, his face strained in agony and fast becoming a death mask. The dark warrior stepped back, a cruel sneer of satisfaction gleaming in his eyes. Bram Forrest, sickened by the unequal contest, rose up from where he lay and moved forward. This drew the attention of both the group and the victorious warrior, and the effect was electric. The huddled observers reacted with a mixture of consternation, awe, and fear that would have been comic under less tense circumstances. They dropped as one to their knees. They placed their foreheads upon the ground. A concerted moan escaped them that far transcended in depth and feeling the one with which they had reacted to the death of the fair warrior. In a language Bram Forrest was completely familiar with, their voices sounded a chant of fear and awe. The white god has come! The white god has come! The white god has come! Bram Forrest scarcely considered them. He was advancing upon the dark warrior with the clean, stalking movements of a tiger, his great shoulders low, his magnificent legs tense for the death spring. The dark one was frozen from surprise. From whence had this naked white creature erupted? He stood stiff from sudden fear and uncertainty a moment too long, and the hands of the Avenger were upon him. 
the fingers of those hands were like steel talons driving deep into his throat, and in his panicked mind he looked upon the face of death and found it horrible. He was being driven down to the ground, lower and lower in abject submission by this strange and terrible manifestation the brown-skinned ones had called a white god. The dark warrior's mind raced, and in his terrorized desperation a native cunning sprang to his aid. Using every ounce of his remaining strength, he forced words up from his tortured throat. "'Would you kill an unarmed man?' The words touched a responsive chord in Bram Forrest's mind. The craven spoke aptly. By killing him thus, was not Bram Forrest doing the same thing for which he had condemned the other? Bram Forrest straightened and hurled the cringing figure from him. "'Then defend yourself, swine!' he cried and seized up the dead warrior's shining whip-sword. The Dark One sought means of escape, but he feared turning from this avenger as much as facing him. He could only play for time. Rising, he retrieved his own sword and faced the other with his expression of fear not one whit abated. The man of the steel hands whipped the sword experimentally, and the Dark One was struck by a ray of hope. The other's actions with the blade were as clumsy as had been those of Jlomek the Nadian. Perhaps all was not lost. The Dark One gripped his blade and moved forward in the customary crouch of the Tarthan fighting man. Then elation welled up within him as the answering posture of the other revealed him as knowing nothing whatever of the whip-sword's use. The Dark One's smile returned. God or not, the skill of this one with the ancient weapon of Tarth was even less than that of the pathetic Jlomek. The dark warrior parried a clumsy thrust with ease and whipped his blade around to harass the other's exposed back. "'You are a fool,' he said, "'whatever else you may be. As you die, give thought to the fact that you join a large company. Those who have faced the greatest swordsman of Tarth and fallen ignobly before his blade.' With that the Dark One whipped his blade home and spun his adversary expertly in order to discover the exact point of entrance of the blade. His aim was true. It was a trifle low, but the other fell heavily and the Dark Warrior withdrew his blade and wiped it uneasily. His nervousness sprang from fear. If one of these so-called gods had appeared, why not two, or four, or a dozen? The Tarthan swordsman, well up on the principles of discretion, felt a sudden urge to be quit of this locality. It was indeed a disconcerting place. Brown folk, the identity and origin of which he knew not. A white creature with steel hands appearing from nowhere. What would the next manifestation be? The dark warrior moved swiftly toward his waiting stad. He mounted and rode away, and not until the figures about the well were tiny spots almost beyond range of his vision did he again breathe easily. End of chapter 7